Well, it's fourth Sunday of the Coptic month of Mizra, and we're coming towards the end of our Coptic year. And as we approach the Coptic New Year, which we'll celebrate together, uh, the first of Tut, but that'll be the 11th of September, two weeks from now, the church causes us to look towards the end. And I think that's what we saw in today's reading. And looking upon the end, we should find hope, and we should find uh, that there is such hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he provides that we ought not to be afraid because he does care about us and he does give us the promise that we will make it through such times. But today I suppose we have a few meditations because then we also have a very well-known saint who is commemorated today, Saint Augustine, who is then associated with two other saints, his mother, Saint Monica, and essentially the one who brought him to the Christian faith and baptized him. We read about this in the Synexar, Saint Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. So I was hoping today we could look very quickly at today's gospel, because these readings are especially difficult, these ones where the Lord expounds about um, the end. They are difficult readings. And then I, I want to look at these three persons, because I do think they provide for us three different models when we approach sin and repentance. Because I, I think in different parts of our lives, I could be an Augustine, I could be a Monica, I could be an Ambrose, maybe one, not the other. But I think we find in, in these three, we find a picture of the repentance in our Lord Jesus Christ. So today's gospel came from Mark. And although the church didn't select the verses prior, uh, the context of the conversation, it starts in verse 4, tell us when these things will be. Okay, well, what things? We, we would have to read the verses prior. Uh, so from verse 1, it says of chapter 13 in the Gospel of Mark, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, teacher, See what manner of stones and what buildings are here. I, I don't know what response he was expecting from Jesus. It's a very beautiful temple. What do you think? But the Lord answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left up upon another that shall not be thrown down. So I don't know what response he was expecting if the Lord was to say it's very nice, it's very beautiful, oh, it is a nice temple. But he definitely was not expecting the Lord to say that the temple is going to be completely leveled. So now the, the apostles are afraid. He's, he's with his four in his inner circle. He's with Andrew, Peter, James, and John, two sets of brothers. And they're wondering, how, well, when is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? And so we see in the first half of this gospel today is the Lord is speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's very interesting that also in the cynics are, it just so happened that we commemorated the prophet Micah, who also prophesied of these things. So now the Lord is speaking about the fulfillment of Micah. But then Mark, he, if you saw, uh, whether you're looking in scripture or in Coptic reader, they had it. But in the scripture, there's a, there's a part that mentions the abomination of desolation spoken of uh, by Daniel. And Mark kind of then in parentheses says, let the reader understand. Because these events should have been well understood by the Christians of this time because what the Lord said had come to pass. In about 66 AD, there was a siege against Jerusalem. Great armies surrounded them, and finally, likely due to the provocation of the zealots against the Roman Empire and other circumstances, Rome finally destroyed Jerusalem and its temple. 
And that was the abomination of desolation, at least historically, that the Lord was speaking about, that this Jerusalem would be destroyed, the temple would once more be leveled to the ground. What's very interesting is perhaps the apostles had hope in the temple. I mean, the temple is where you did all the sacrifices. It's where you worshiped. It's where you did everything. Their relationship with God essentially was in that temple. But they also looked at it almost as a monument, a worldly thing. They thought, look at this great temple. But I think the Lord was very clear, at least in John chapter 4, the worship God desires is the worship in spirit. These things of the law should pass away. And goodness, even the fathers, they, they recognize this as finally the Jews' stubbornness and their rebellion against God has caught up to them. This was judgment against them for their rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then the Lord begins to speak about his own coming. And we won't go too much into that, but he does give us some kind of advice. He advises us to be watchful and to be prepared. So, okay, I ask myself, okay, Lord, what does it mean for me to be prepared? What am I watching for? I mean, I, I could ask Abuna what the signs are, and we could have a very interesting conversation. And we've seen many things fulfilled. I mean, even the apostles, the Lord spoke about war and famine and other things, but he said, this is just the beginning. But then he started to speak to them about different persecutions, and you'll be sent before, at least in the Greek, it says the Sanhedrin. So you'll be judged by the Jews, but then he even mentions... And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. It won't just be the Jews that will persecute you. It will be on a worldwide scale. I think we see that today. So the Jews saw these things fulfilled in their time, and they're wondering, Lord, what do you mean to watch? Or at least this is what I'm wondering. Am I ready for the coming of the Lord? What is my relationship with him? Would I recognize him if I saw him? Those are parables that the Lord has given. Lord, when did we see you thirsty or hungry or naked? I tell you, as much as you did to the, to the least of the brethren, you have done unto me. Those that saw the Lord and recognized his wedding and put on the proper garments and went and attended the feast, these are the ones who were saved. Those who prepared themselves with repentance and returned to him had such relationship with him. And I think that's what we find in the story of St. Augustine. We find we're presented with a saint who ultimately is not so much a saint because of his writings, although he has lots of writings, he has lots of ideas, lots of homilies, lots of different exhortations and commentaries on scripture. But that's not the reason why, the, why we, we recognize the sainthood. We look at the sainthood of Augustine because he is a saint of repentance. He is a person that from his youth loved sin for the sake of sin. So a lot of his life we get from his autobiography. It's called The Confessions by St. Augustine. It's so popular, if you went to Barn and Noble or any bookstore, you would find it. Very popular book, very often read. First, it's broken up in about 13 or 14 books. The first great many are his life, whereas the latter few are different, um, different times where he gets into philosophical discourses on different topics. But he mentions in his life, he, he mentions his time, I guess he got, he got in with the wrong crowd. That was his big problem. He didn't have really great friends. And they go and they, they find this neighbor has a tree. Maybe it was a peach tree, I'm not sure. And they would go and they would steal the fruit <clears throat> from this tree. And we don't know whether the, the owner of the tree really noticed. We, we don't know if he found out. And they would take the fruit, they wouldn't even eat it, maybe a bite, 
but then they would toss it. The goal of his sin was not to eat the fruit. It wasn't to satisfy any hunger. He just found sin very thrilling. He found it exciting. And it's a bit scary because I, I think sometimes there is a certain feeling when it comes to sin. And I've, we're presented with an analogy from among the, the writings of the fathers or perhaps the desert fathers. Sin in this concept could be thought of like a field. If we were to take a walk in the field, you know, very tall grass, we're not going to find a path. It's going to be super tough. So we're going to go and try to move the grass. We're stepping on the grass. It's not going to be a good time. We're not going to enjoy it. But then let's say we make a habit of this. Okay, so we walk back and forth through. What do you think will happen to the grass as I'm stepping on it and we're passing through it so often? Eventually, I'm going to make a path. And it'll be very easy to walk on this path. Such is sin. I mean, the devil couldn't just tell us to outright do something that we recognize as sin. It has to be a bunch of truth mixed in with a little lie. It is uncomfortable to sin at first because we feel scandalized and we feel like we're betraying God. But if we continue in such sin, it becomes a habit. That's why you might find things like the vape pen or marijuana or any other sort of gateway, uh, narcotics or drugs. Oh, you know, it's more sociably acceptable. Okay, well, what path does that lead us down? when we find, well, that hit isn't getting me the same high that I had before, I must go to something worse. Although Augustine is picking the fruits from the tree, that is not enough for him. He had, and he talks about this, a very, very difficult time with lust, even taking mistresses, even fathering a child, a very hard life on him. And as much as he tried to get away from it, he even tried to send her away and to repent, he got more because he never had the truth. Yes, his mother, Monica, she was, she was Christian. His father was pagan. But maybe perhaps because his father pushed him so much towards academia and did not care so much about his faith, He grew very far from the church. I don't know if that's something that children today face, where we push our children so far towards academia, but then they're nowhere to be found in church, or that same push is not had there. Did I do my daily studies? Well, good. But who asked me whether I did my daily readings or my daily prayer? Because in those last days, which one will the Lord ask me about? Will he ask me if I had done my studies for my class? Or had I read the scripture and gotten to know him in a very personal and intimate way? And it was likely because of the tears of his mother, Monica, that Augustine was slowly brought back towards the faith. At one point, he met a doctor who told him, you can't be teaching astrology. You can't be looking to the stars and trying to convince people. He was an order by profession. He would speak, and the doctor's like, you can't be lying to people. Hmm, okay, then let me look for truth. A priest tried to talk to Augustine very early on. He wouldn't listen to this priest. Eventually, he got into one of the second or third century heresies of the church, Manichaeism, which is like a charismatic movement that sees worldly things as evil and heavenly things as good. So there's like a dualistic cosmology. He he practiced for nine years, and he, he would advise people, but he didn't find that intellectual satisfaction he would have in the true Orthodox faith. And it wasn't until he met the leader of the charismatic movement. Oh, you have so many questions, Augustine. Wait till you meet this guy. He'll he'll give you everything because 
whoever the leader is, they believe either they have the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit incarnate. It, it's a very weird heresy, and it kind of continues today. Uh, but he met the person, the guy didn't know anything. So Augustine's like, I, I don't get the point of this. I don't get the point. So he's in a very excellent circumstance after so many years where he could finally be open towards Scripture. So then we see his mother, Monica, weeping, crying, praying, asking for her son to recognize the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we could suppose God sent Ambrose of Milan. Now, Ambrose of Milan is a very interesting character because for the bulk of his life, maybe until his 50s, he was not baptized. He was a judge in the court, but a very righteous judge, very well-liked, beloved by the people. So much so that when their bishop died and they asked, you know, who would you nominate to be the bishop of Milan? They said, Ambrose. Ambrose is not a Christian. He's not anything. Baptize Ambrose and make him our bishop. Okay, so they, they went against all the canons. They baptized Ambrose. So Ambrose spends his night in catechism and his days preaching. And Ambrose is very excellent. Ambrose is very good. And Augustine loves Ambrose. The answers he could not find in Manichaeism, he found in Ambrose. And Ambrose, as we read in the Cynics, are recommended to him to read the Holy Scriptures. Augustine thought Isaiah was difficult. He skipped over. He read other things. And eventually, he gave himself to study. And finally, the tears of his mother, Monica, led to the baptism of her son, Augustine, through the work of Ambrose. And looking at all this, I see Augustine, someone who is very much deeply con uh, conflicted. I want to live a life of celibacy, but I am controlled by lust. I don't know how to overcome it. I want to come to the Lord, and yet my heart is not on fire. I don't want my mother to grieve anymore, but I don't know how to satisfy her. I could in my life be an Augustine in this difficult position. I don't know what to do. It's tough. At other times, I could be a Monica. And this might be a special place reserved for the mothers because she is a model of motherhood, a mother who did not care so much that he became a great orator, did not care so much that he was popular. She just wanted him to be baptized. And she wept so much, and she prayed. And it wasn't that she prayed, God didn't answer her prayer, so she stopped praying. She is a model of long-suffering. She didn't quit. She taught us how to pray without ceasing, to continually make a petition. And her prayer was answered. Perhaps in other times, I could be an Ambrose. And Ambrose isn't just reserved for the priests. But we also find, and St. John Chrysostom talks about this, many of us are in positions to be more persuasive, to help others in a way that Abuna could not. Because sure, Abuna is our father, very excellent, very good. But perhaps there's someone with whom you have a deep relationship with. They'll talk to you on the phone. They'll talk about their problems with you. Either A, I could gossip and make it much worse and, you know, light the, light the fire and make it much, much worse. Or I can lead them to godly advice. Hey, you know, maybe I don't know much. Like at least, you know, maybe offer to pray or at least offer, you know, have you gone to church? Have you, have you written this on a little note and put it on the altar? And maybe talk to them about their faith. I don't know too much. I don't know what I could advise someone on, but, you know, as much of maybe it's not good that we're still fighting. Have you considered apologizing to the person? Have you considered just sweeping it under the rug and being forgiving? Have you talked to a buona about it? Maybe that little thing, maybe that's enough. So I pray that as we move towards the end of this, we conclude this Coptic year of 1738 AM, I pray that... Um, let us continue to be watchful. Let us continue in our repentance. Let us continue. We're a church. We are a community. Let's continue in love towards one another, care towards one another as we approach this Eucharistic cup. 
um, and this meal at the table. To our Lord Jesus Christ belongs the glory and honor with his good Father and the Holy Spirit, and glory be to God forever. Amen.